It's five o'clock somewhere, Connor, and I'm going to tell you about uh, an occasion that I recently had to sit down in a faraway pub and sip at a freshly poured Guinness and have a chat with uh, Mr. Tim Brown. Hi, I'm Tim Brown. I'm a kidney transplant surgeon. I live in Belfast and I work at the Belfast City Hospital. Uh, and I've got the luckiest, uh, I'm the luckiest man in the world to be able to do what I do. Mr. Brown or Dr. Brown, how should I be addressing this surgeon? I don't mind. You can call me Tim. I really doesn't, I don't really care about these things. So yeah, absolutely. Call me whatever you like. Okay. So what did you chat about with Tim? We talked about something that matters to more people than you can imagine. We talked about organ transplants, specifically kidneys. Okay, and that's what matters in this episode. I'm Connor. And I'm Dodie. And this is Discovery Matters. Tim is a smiling man who loves his job, and it might seem strange that Tim loves his job after you hear how often he deals with death or with near death. In the UK, there are about 8,000 people on the waiting list for a kidney. And there are currently uh, around 3,000 donors a year in the UK, so clearly there's a huge gap between supply and demand. Uh, The really scary uh, statistic is three people in the UK every day die waiting for an organ. You're right. There is a shortage of donor organs, of course. I mean, in any given year, there are hundreds of thousands of patients on the waiting list for an organ, and maybe worldwide, 80,000 receives uh, an organ transplant. Wait, who's this? My name is Henrik Nittmar. I'm the CEO of Coraline Biomedical. Yeah, sorry. We're going to leave Tim back in the pub in Belfast for a few minutes, and we're going to hear more from Henrik, the new guy because uh, they're involved in the same fight. We're going to come back to Tim, but right now, Henrik, we're going to hear what he's doing. We're trying to better the outcome of transplantation, kidney transplantation specifically, by improving uh, organ quality into that that kind of uh, surgery. And unlike Tim, Henrik is not a surgeon. He's a businessman. He's the CEO. I'm a PhD in innovation management, so I drive the development of of the product rather than than the science. The perspectives that you bring to a company like this should be complementary, and I I definitely bring a complementary perspective to the kind of hard science of of clinical science that you you normally meet. So I think we do do kind of feed into each other's um, perspectives. Now, Connor, you know how we ask all of our guests on Discovery Matters to explain stuff to regular Joes? Henrik gave us a pretty good analogy. If, you, if I could use the metaphor of a house, uh, we're trying to improve on the plumbing of that house. If you have a leakage in, in the plumbing, that will lead to immediate consequences of kind of a water leakage or something like that, but also downstream, uh, maybe a rotten wooden structure or something like that in the house. And the same goes for a, for a kidney. That is, uh, if you have a... The plumbing then is the vasculature in that in that kidney. If you have an injured vascular bed, that will lead to immediate effects uh, during transplantation in terms of coagulation and immune reaction problems. And also downstream, that will lead to a poorer functioning graft or a transplant, uh, if you look maybe three to five years out. We're repairing the plumbing. We are mending the, the leakages. Uh, we are mending the injuries in the vasculature bed with a tool that we have developed. So it is very much of, of trying to improve on, on the plumbing that is already there. We're not repiping the house, we're just repairing it uh, and making it um, making it sustain the kind of uh, pressure that the transplantation is, is for the patient and, and the organ. And what Coraline Biomedical's technology also does is help produce better quality organs. The organ shortage, the imbalance between a need for transplantation and the the donor pool uh, leads to surgeons accepting what they call expanded criteria donors. That is really in in layman's terms, that is uh, donors, donor organs from from older donors that have a history of illness, for example, hypertension or uh, prediabetes or something like that. 
and that leads to maybe poorer plumbing in those organs, if I may use that metaphor. Uh, and then they are more susceptible to the, the damage that occurs during transplantation, which is the one we want to avoid. So we are improving on, on the quality of existing organs, but we also, in long term, uh, uh, giving the surgeons an opportunity to accept those organs into transplantation. That is how we try to increase the pool of organs. So we're using a, a, a very well-known pharmaceutical agent that is called heparin. It has been in use for more than 100 years. And daily, uh, even today, it's used in all kind of surgical operations uh, to avoid blood, blood clotting uh, when, when, uh, when doing surgical operations. Uh, so, uh, and, and that is a very good pharmaceutical agent and well known for its functionality and its benefits. Uh, it has a drawback, uh, that is if you over administer it, if you give the patient too much, there is a very, uh, a very uh, high risk of, of that p patient bleeding to death, actually. So you, you definitely need to avoid higher concentrations systemically. So the way we do that is to trying to modify surfaces, attaching that molecule to surfaces where we want to have it, and then avoiding the systemic administration at all. So we're trying to modify surfaces. So that is the basic of the technology. So if we go back to Henrik's metaphor of a house and repairing the pipes in the house, getting the plumbing sorted out, really instead of improving all the pipes everywhere, Qualine Biomedical look for the specific joint where there is an issue and that that is the place that gets the repairs. Exactly. So based on that heparin technology, we have uh, uh, designed and manufactured a ma large molecule, a macromolecular conjugate of heparin. And that has the function to actually, when it's flushed through the kidney, so we just flush it through the kidney, the pipes, the piping, the vasculature, and it finds those sites that are injured and actually adheres to the, those sites and sits on those when uh, the patient's blood, uh, the, the, the patient that receives the, the organ, receives the organ, uh, and when that blood is flushed over those sites, it doesn't recognize those sites as injured anymore. The mended pipings or pipes. And what's important to note is that this is all just the beginning for Henrik and Coraline Biomedical. Uh, we had just started our phase one trial, uh, which is done in, in Uppsala and at the Karolinska Institute in, in Stockholm. Uh, and so we started that recruitment and the plan is to report that study uh, end of this year and then going further on to development in phase two and three studies. So what's Henrik's vision though? For example, like in a hypothetical situation, after a motorcycle accident and there's a kidney available for someone who's been on a list for five years, what would Corline's innovation actually do? Our vision is that this, this technology could be used to prevent the, the, the injury that is sustained during the transplantation that we're trying to avoid. In clinical terms, it's called DGF, delayed graft function, and that is defined by the patient actually going back to dialysis during the first seven days after transplantation. So it's it's a kind of, you could say, failure because you want to avoid having dialysis sessions after being transplanted. So our vision is to completely avoid those uh, uh, DGFs to occur uh, at all. Uh, and our kind of secondary vision is to, to lower the rate significantly, significantly. And in the terms of the motorcycle ac uh, accident you were referring to, one might then say that uh, that we want to add this preventive technology to avoid that DGF, no matter what type of, of uh, recipient that you present to that organ. So you have 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 the possibility to avoid all those uh, injuries that you want that would otherwise sustain. So it sounds like we're back in the pub with you, uh, your Guinness and Tim Brown. We are indeed, and we're just getting started. So Tim was telling me that the alternative to organ donation, of course, is to be put on dialysis. But this is really no form of guarantee. So the mortality rate on dialysis is really high, and the mortality rate after a kidney transplant is 
much lower. So a kidney transplant, as soon as I take the clamps off, doubles your life expectancy compared to being on dialysis. So what you've got to remember is that we're comparing mortality of a transplant with mortality on what the alternative is, and that's dialysis, which is not a good thing. I always say to people, dialysis keeps you alive, but it's not very good for you. And if you can get a transplant, then that's by far and away the best thing. That's the gold standard treatment. So there's no need to say, this is a really serious situation Mm -hmm. with all the transplants and Mm -hmm. organ donations needed and that question of supply and demand. Yeah, but Tim is trying something new to improve this very question of supply and demand. So in Belfast, what, what we've um, we've looked at our waiting list and we've said, well, okay, we've got five, five or six years ago, we had 350 people on the waiting list and we thought, my goodness, how do we address this problem? Because we have a huge gap between supply and demand. So the first thing that we did was we concentrated on our living donor programme. Dr. Ashley Courtney, who's a nephrologist in Belfast, uh, headed up a phenomenal uh, quality improvement type project to increase our living donation rate. So when she started, we were doing six living donor transplants a year. And last year we did 77. Humans are like jet en- jet airplanes. We can fly around with one engine if you apply the kidney analogy. So um, we don't need both um, and we can get away, get around with one very adequately. But we have to make sure that uh, there's stringent checks in place before we allow people to go on and donate. So the first thing is we concentrated on looking at the donors and we increased our donor rate to the extent that our donor rate is now 43 per million, which is the highest rate of living donation anywhere on the planet, which is something we're hugely proud of. The second thing we did was we concentrated on what we call extended criteria uh, deceased donors. So the patients are the donors that uh, ordinarily wouldn't have become donors. We're now concentrating on taking the higher risk organs and transplanting them in because a higher risk transplant is still probably better than life on dialysis and the mortality rate on dialysis. Um, So um, by increasing our cadaveric transplant rate in, in, in association with increasing our living donor rate, what we've done is we've managed to get our waiting list from 350 down to around 120. And what we've done also is reduce our waiting time. So waiting time is also related to your mortality on the waiting list. The longer you wait, the more likely you are to die even with a transplant. So our waiting time has gone from five years to two years on average. So we're very, very proud of what we've achieved in Belfast just with a little bit of hard graft and uh, in increasing the risk. And although Tim and his team in Belfast can boast of the best statistics internationally, they're not alone in celebrating their numbers. Organ donation rate, I'm pleased to say, is going up uh, in the States, it's going up in the UK, um, it's going up all over Europe. Um, We've got some fantastic success stories in Spain, Croatia and Portugal who are achieving the world's best cadaveric organ donation rates. And they've achieved this by um, making sure their society is fully signed up to the concept of organ donation. And I think it's one of those gifts that society should really get behind, that organ donation shouldn't be a debate whenever you're approached. It should be, yeah, absolutely, why would you not? Um, So as a result, organ donation rate is going up across the world, which is great news, but it's going up very slowly. And uh, that is good news, but it's no consolation to somebody who's dying on the waiting list currently uh, for want of another organ. Tim told me of a specific example of a kidney transplant that showed the possible future of science. And it's, you got to check this out, it's all based around 3D printing. In order to try and uh, increase our likelihood of success, um, we took a complex situation where a daughter needed a kidney from her father, and her father, in actual fact, had a small tumour in the kidney. Um, ordinarily, this wouldn't be a transplantable situation. Obviously, um, we wouldn't want to transplant a kidney with a tumour in it. Um, but what we were able to do, because this girl desperately needed an organ, what we were able to do was take the risk. Uh, after discussion with the family, they were happy to carry on with the risk. Um, so we got a 3D printed model exact replica of the kidney containing the tumour that allowed me to plan a procedure precisely to the last millimetre which allowed me to excise the tumour, repair the kidney and then transplant it in and as a result we have a young mother who's walking around today and she has now a normal life expectancy compared to being on dialysis and waiting to die. So look, I've been really excited about 3D printing in regenerative medicine ever since I saw them print Mila Jojovic in The Fifth Element um, back in, what, 1997 or something like that? Reconstruction complete. 
told you. Perfect. So, I was kind of surprised to see the first application being um, something in surgical planning rather than actually printing organs. But uh, this is really taking things uh, a step in the direction that we've been imagining for a long time. So look, another hypothetical here. What if that young mother, Tim, had helped save? What if her daughter, maybe in the future one day, might need a transplant of her own? Are we going to get to the stage where we could actually use 3D printing technology, not just to plan surgery, but to actually print her the organ that she needs? Are we going to get to that? Or is that just in my sci-fi brain somewhere? So I wondered that, too. And it seems like Tim has been thinking the same thing, too. In fact, um, that's on his Christmas list. That's exactly what I want in my Santa Claus list. I want to be able to go to a shelf and use her uh, specific DNA to be able to print off an organ so that I'm able to transplant it into her without the need for immunosuppression before she ever ends up on dialysis. That would be my holy grail. However, I think... Probably in the future, um, people like me will be a thing of the past. Transplant surgeons will will not be required because uh, the tissue engineers and the cell biologists will have stem cell technology down to a T so that instead of me having to replace their organs, what they may be able to do is to inject some sort of cell or elixir, if you like, into the organ that will repair the broken organ without me needing to put in a new one. I think that's probably where we should be heading. Um, personalised healthcare, so we use the patient's own cells to redesign themselves, I think would be the holy grail. And um, I would be sorry to be a thing of the past because I love what I do, but do you know what? If it's all about the patient, a patient doesn't want to transplant if they didn't have to have one. Okay, so look, we're all over the place here. We seem to have to go through from the whole scale. We're in a drastically desperate situation. He's got this vision for 3D organ printing, and maybe in an ideal world, he'd like to be. Uh, completely unemployed. This is like getting whiplash in this conversation. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> I'm going to go and cry into my <laughs> cry into my beer in a minute. So yeah, absolutely. So m- maybe we need to do every episode of Discovery Matters in a pub. But um, this was <laughs> a really alcoholic first. one. Uh, tune in next time for a more sober episode of Discovery Matters. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. Our executive producer is Andrea Killen. Discovery Matters is produced in collaboration with Soundtelling. Production and music by Thomas Henley.